All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, here we are, another Lord's Day. We want to return back to where we left off last week. Uh, and that is back in the Beatitudes. Uh, back to Matthew chapter 5. So if you've got your Bible with you, I, I would encourage you to take your Bible and, and turn to Matthew chapter 5, where we find in this wonderful portion of Scripture, our Lord laying out for us, and, and really everyone, what it truly means, uh, well, what it means to be happy, because you notice uh, they all begin, uh, each of the first uh, 12 verses begin with uh, happy or blessed, but also what it means to live in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I guess you could say that's a good way of summarizing not just the Beatitudes, but the, the whole Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. Uh, Jesus is uh, telling us, uh, his disciples, what it means to be truly happy. And uh, being truly happy is what it means to live in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Or simply, if you want to just say what he's doing here in the Beatitudes is describing what a Christian looks like, what a Christian is and what a Christian looks like. And as we've said over the last few weeks, this is very, very important. Um, we, we better get it right in knowing who is a Christian and even what a Christian looks like. Now, last week, uh, as I said, we got a head start by looking at the first beatitude. That's uh, verse 3, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. But you'll remember we only got halfway. And so I do want to pick it back up where we left off and finish that beatitude before we move on. But I think it would be helpful if we just read again as we do each we, uh, the first 12 verses, just so we have everything in our mind and in the context. So verses 1 to 12, let me just read it for us. You read along uh, yourself. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Of course, that's Jesus and his disciples. And then Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, what we just read in those eight Beatitudes have been rightly described as the marks or the characteristics of true Christianity. This is describing what a Christian is and what a Christian looks like. That is his character and his conduct. Uh, remember, we said that uh, the last couple of weeks, and we'll probably say it every week because it's so important to remind ourselves. This is what Jesus is doing. He's telling us what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom, someone who is already in the kingdom. And again, let me just emphasize that. He's not describing necessarily how you get in the kingdom, though you could argue that in one sense. But the greater sense is he's describing those who are already in the kingdom. I think I said the first week, this is the flip side of John 3. Uh, you remember John 3, Jesus and Nicodemus. And three times Jesus says to Nicodemus, you remember what he said? If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be what? You must be born again. Three times, uh, just for emphasis. You must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. And so the question then comes here is, well, what does that look like? What does being born again look like? What does it look like for someone who has been regenerated, filled with the Spirit of God? This is what Jesus is describing. And in a word, you could say it's someone with a beatitude attitude. I mean, if you want to reduce everything here in the Sermon on the Mount and think about how do I describe a Christian? How do I know if a so-and-so is a Christian? He says he's a Christian. She says she's a Christian. How do I know if they are truly a Christian? Well, these are the things you're going to want to look for. Do they have a beatitude attitude or beatitudes attitudes? That's what we look for. That's what we look for in ourselves, and that's what we look for in someone else who claims to be a Christian. Do we or they possess and manifest 
again, a beatitude attitude as described in these 12 verses. So again, you can see how important these are uh, to get right. We, we better get these right. Uh, salvation's at stake, eternity's at stake, heaven's at stake. And so that's why, you know, taking two messages to get to at least the first one and probably two messages for each of these because we, we better get it right. So verse 3 is where we're at, the first beatitude. Let me read it again. Jesus says here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everybody see that? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're obviously interested in understanding what that exactly means and what that exactly looks like. And to get to the bottom of this and to, and to all the Beatitudes, uh, the best way of getting to the bottom of what it means and what it looks like is to ask questions. And that's what we began last week. There's just uh, a couple questions we asked, and then we're going to pick that back up and ask some more questions this morning. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Um, now, you'll remember from last week, just real quickly, by way of review, just so we can have a, a running start to where we want to pick up. The, the two main questions that we looked at last week were, why does Jesus begin here, right? Why does Jesus begin here? That, that is, why is this first beatitude attitude a Christian will have as she or he enters the kingdom of God? Why is this the first beatitude attitude a Christian will have as she or he enters the kingdom of God? Well, uh, again, if you remember from last week, uh, if you weren't sure when I asked the question, hopefully by the end you know the answer, and it's fairly simple. Uh, you start here because poor in spirit is the most fundamental mark of someone who is truly born again. You got that? The, the most fundamental, most base, foundational characteristic of someone who is a Christian is they're going to be poor in spirit. I mean, you think about it. It has to begin here. To become a Christian means what? Begin, to become a Christian means it's the end of you, right? The emptying of yourself, realizing that spiritually you have absolutely nothing to offer God. Now, the opposite, of, of course, would mean that you are what? Rich in spirit, right? Rich in spirit, and that means that you think you have something to boast about. And that's the world with their religions, right? I mean, being poor in spirit means there's a humility that says, I am a wretched sinner and I have nothing, no thing that I can offer God for Him to save me. Nothing. There's nothing inside of me. And there's certainly nothing outside of me that can merit me justified before God. There's, there's nothing, no thing, as I said, that I can offer God that says, here, take this, take that, and that should satisfy you in order for me to go to heaven, to be saved, or to justify me. Being poor in spirit says you actually have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. And as I said, the world doesn't understand that. Didn't understand it in Jesus' day, and it certainly doesn't understand it today. And this is why Jesus begins here. If you want to be in the kingdom, you have to recognize that you are poor in spirit. And again, you think about it, being poor in spirit knocks down every single religion that's out there, right? I mean, you think about every single religion out there, and, and, and in fact, uh, you, it, just to be clear, you understand that on, on, over here is biblical Christianity, and over here is every other religion in the world, whatever it is. I mean, you can think of Islam, you think of Judaism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, Mormonism. Uh, you go right down the line, they're all the same. Generically, I mean, they're different in parts, of course. But as a whole, you would describe them as they think they're rich in spirit, proud in spirit. Biblical Christianity says, oh, the only way to get to heaven is that you have to be poor in spirit. Humble. Absolutely destitute. Remember the picture of someone who's poor in spirit is the, the beggar that's in the corner cowering in the dark with his hand up and says, Be merciful to me, O God, the sinner. All these other religions says, Aha, look at me. 
I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm climbing my way up to God and when I get there, I can just give him all my good works and good deeds. There's a word for that and it's called what? Pride. You think you have something to boast about. And Jesus comes along and says, no. You're not justified by establishing your own righteousness, your own religion, your own works. In fact, at the root of it all, it has nothing to do with you on the outside. It has everything to do with you on the where? On the inside. You must. You must. This is where it all begins. You must be poor in spirit. Now, just again, to quickly review, uh, for me at least, and maybe I hope it's helpful for you, just to remind you again that this was a year and a half in Jesus' ministry. Right? Uh, I know it's in Matthew 5 and you think, it's, oh, it's right at the beginning. No, it's a year and a half of Jesus' ministry, a year and a half of healing, a year and a half of teaching. But most importantly, you could say a year and a half of going head to head with the Jewish religious authorities. Remember that? De debating this, debating that. I mean, they're getting wound up and Jesus is calm and collected and just, you know, walks through and walks out. And Jesus was there and he was interested in establishing, or, or really in a sense reestablishing, because whatever Jesus said and, and was establishing was there in the Old Testament as well. But we, we can say he was establishing or reestablishing the biblical religion of the heart and justification by faith. That's what he was doing. He was getting back to the heart, back to the heart. The issue is the heart. And again, we can say that's in the Old Testament as well. But somewhere along the line, the Jewish establishment and the Jewish religious groups uh, lost that. They didn't see that because they were what? proud in spirit. In fact, the Jews of that day were interested in what? External religion and justification by works. To put it in another way, Jesus was interested in the people being poor in spirit in order to get to the kingdom of heaven. The Jews were interested in the people being what? Rich in spirit in order to get to the kingdom of heaven. So you, you have a chasm between two different ways to get in the kingdom. I mean, that's fairly straightforward. Now, to be fair, not all, the Jew, not all the Jews were the same. They were the same in wanting to work their way to God. That's true. So in a general sense, they were all the same. But in particulars, uh, they had different meanings of what that work meant. For example, and again, I, th I think this will be helpful in knowing the context and who Jesus is actually addressing besides the disciples in this sermon. I mean, go back up to verse 1 for a moment. Okay, Matthew here gives us the setting. Look at verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. And so you, you see there, there's crowds, right? Now, in verse 2, he seems to be directly speaking and teaching to his disciples, but there's crowds there as well. I think I said a couple weeks ago. It's like church. When everybody comes to church, the preacher behind the pulpit is, is really aiming his message to the Christian, to the disciples. He's, church is about edifying and encouraging and building up the saints. Now, obviously, there's going to be unbelievers there. You know, friends come, people walk in, but his main address is to the disciples, and that was Jesus here. But nevertheless, there were crowds there, and the question would be, who, who's in that crowd? Who's in that multitude? Well, all sorts of people, of course, but no doubt, there would have been there uh, the, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious establishment of the day. Now you say, well, who, who's, who's that? Well, basically Judaism of Jesus' day was made up of four different kinds of religious groups. Uh, and I think this would be helpful just to quickly go through it. Four different categories or parties. And so this multitude would have aligned themselves with one of those four. All right? You weren't one of Jesus' disciples, but you were there just to, you know, be a fly on the wall to hear what this prophet has to say, so-called prophet has to say. You, you would have been aligning yourself with one of those four religious groups. You say, what are they? Well, they would have been, and some of these you might be familiar with, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. You heard of them before? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the, the Zealots. And I mention them because if we identify those four... Listen, if we identify those, those four, we might get a bit of an idea of the religious thinking of Jesus' day and what he had to face and ultimately what he had to change. 
Because everything in the Sermon on the Mount will fly right in the face of all four of those groups. And let me show you that real quick. Let me just give you a quick sketch of each one. I, again, I think this will be helpful. It was helpful for me and hopefully it'd be helpful for you if I deliver it right. So the first is the Pharisees. The Pharisees. You're probably more familiar with them than the other three. Uh, these were the legalists. You, you know that. If you know anything about the Pharisees, they were the legalists. They believed that true happiness was found in legalism. That true happiness was keeping all the laws. Uh, these group. Uh, this group, these guys, you, you might say, were the traditionalists. The traditionalists. True happiness was never changing. Never changing, just keeping tradition. Uh, this is how it's always been done. You ever heard that before? This is how we always do it. They were ultra-conservative, making themselves truly pious, and what they believed were truly, quote-unquote, biblical. Again, true happiness to them was the externals. Legalism, external legislation. And then as a result... They weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping who? They were worshiping themselves. They worshiped self. That's what legalism is at its core. It's a worship of self. I remember that in Luke 18? The, the, the Pharisee there on the corner? I, I thank God that I am not like other men. It's all about I. All about I. It's all about self. So for them, true happiness was found in their own accomplishments taking all the religious boxes, looking down on all those who weren't as holy as them. Then you had the Sadducees. The Sadducees had a, a different view on happiness. Still wrong, but, but different. And if the Pharisees were the legalists, then the Sadducees were the liberals. The liberals, the theological liberals. They believed that true happiness was found in rationalism. And so naturally, they were anti-supernatural. Angels didn't make sense to them, so they didn't believe in angels. A resurrection didn't make sense to them, so they didn't believe in a resurrection. Y you could say that true happiness for them was the pursuit of the mind. The mind. They elevated the mind, they exalted the mind, and ultimately, in a the sense, they worshipped what? The mind. The mind. So we have the legalists, the Sadducees, thirdly, the Essenes. The Essenes, and they were different as well. But these guys, you could say, were the monastic type, very cultish, living out in the desert in the caves, living with the very bare minimum of life, with few clothes, little food, hardly any uh, creature comforts at all. Some of you might have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran Caves. Uh, that, that, where we found all those scrolls, was found in a compound, so to speak, that were uh, built by Essenes. That, that was the religious group of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes. They were a cult. They moved south near the Dead Sea, away from Jerusalem, away from everybody, kind of secluded. Um, that's the Essenes. The, the Essenes believed that true happiness was found in asceticism. Asceticism. Well, you've heard of that before? Uh, asceticism is just a fancy word for self-denial. For them, the path to true happiness was in the absence of things. Pleasing God was not having anything, very little. And in that sense, what did they worship? They worshiped the flesh. They worshiped the flesh. And then lastly, the fourth religious group that perhaps were on that day when Jesus preached the sermon were the zealots. You heard of them? The, the, the zealots. These were the rebel rousers. They believed true happiness was found in terrorism. Their view of life was, let's overthrow Rome, sneak up behind a Roman soldier, and stick a sword between the shoulder blades. That's true happiness. True happiness is massacring Romans. True happiness is found in taking over the state. Nationalism. So what did they worship? They worshiped power. They worshiped power. So, so all of that to say is, coming back to Matthew 5, here's a society that is quite divided and diverse on their idea to the path of true happiness, what they thought was makarios and what it truly looked like. And here you have some that believed happiness is found in legalism, you know, ceremonial rituals, keeping rules and routine. You have some that believe happiness is found in rationalism. Others think it's asceticism. And then there was terrorism, those who thought happiness was having full control. 
Now, you look at those four groups, and what's your response? Nothing's really changed, has it? Not a thing has changed. We still have all four today. I mean, we still have the legalists, right? Those caught up in ritual and ceremony. Happiness is found in religion, doing religion. Well, whatever the church tells me to do, that's what I do. Whatever the system requires me to do, I do it. My own self-worth and self-righteousness, that makes me happy. And of course, we still have the rationalists today. I mean, this is probably the strongest of the four groups today. Those who tell everyone to abandon religion. It's not rational. It's illogical. Happiness is the intellectual pursuit. Happiness is pursuing science. Science is the, the God of today. Science is the answer for everything. The scientific experts, right? That's what we're even told right now, right? Listen to the experts. Listen to the scientists. And then there are those still around, not many of them, at least in the West, who believe Happiness is in the minimum of life. Crazy love, right? As some call it. Happiness is not having much. And then in certain areas of the world, we are all too aware that zealots are alive and well. <laughs> right? Terrorism and the massing of power makes these folks happy. Now my point here, and I hope you get it already, my point here is that whatever group you find yourself in, the common characteristic, the common mark of all of them is not poor in spirit, but what? Proud in spirit. Rich in spirit. And guess what? As a result, none of them will enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. He says you fundamentally must be poor in spirit. In fact, you go down to verse 20 of chapter 5. We've noted it a couple weeks ago. He says, uh, just an alarming statement, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because they're not getting in. Wow. So, what does poor in spirit mean and why does Jesus begin here? Well, let me summarize before we move on to our next question, and I'm going to summarize by reading Martin Lloyd-Jones' summary of what poor in spirit means and why, why Jesus begins here. He says this, Poor in spirit means a complete absence of pride, a complete absence of self-assurance and of self-reliance. It means a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. It is nothing then that we can produce. It is nothing that we can do in our, of ourselves. It is just this tremendous awareness of our utter nothingness as we come face to face with God. That is to be poor in spirit. Let me put it as strongly as I can, and I do so on the basis of the teaching of the Bible, Lord Jones says. It means this, that if we are truly Christian, we shall not rely upon our natural birth. We shall not rely upon the fact that we belong to certain families. We shall not boast that we belong to certain nations or nationalities. We shall not build upon our natural temperament. We shall not believe and rely upon our natural position in life or any powers that may have been given to us. We shall not rely upon money or any wealth we may have. The thing about which we shall boast will not be the education we have received or the particular school or college to which we have been. No, all that is what Paul in Philippians 3 regarded as dung and a hindrance to this greater thing because it tended to master and control. And we shall not, he goes on, rely upon any gifts like the natural personality or intelligence or general or special ability. We shall not rely upon our own morality and conduct and good behavior. We shall not bank to the slightest extent on the life we have lived or are trying to live. No, he concludes, we shall regard all that as Paul regarded it dung. And that, he says, is poverty of spirit, end quote. I mean, he said quite a bit there, and he could have kept going. We could keep going. I mean, you think of all the things people boast about. And he's right. Just like the hymn writer, by the way, where he says, remember this hymn? Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Savior die, would he Devote that sacred head for such, remember the next line? A worm such as I. 
That's the perspective, folks. That's the perspective you and I need to have. And that's what it means to be poor in spirit, realizing that you are a worm. You are a worm. You know, Jonathan Edwards was preaching on this particular subject one time. And somewhere in his sermon, he compared sinners to rats. Uh, at the end of the sermon, a well-to-do businessman went up to Edwards and said, I'm offended. Comparing me to a rat, I want an apology. Edwards said that he would prayerfully consider it. And then the following Sunday, he gets up in the pulpit and he did apologize to the rats. He said that it was horribly unfair to rats. Rats, he said, have honor. In all their rattiness, they do nothing but what God created them to do. And he says, where is the sinner who does that? So he says, my apologies to any rat that was offended. Think about it. No worm ever treated their creator like we have. No rat ever treated their creator like we have. This is what being poor in spirit means. Do you understand that? A right evaluation of yourself, a right diagnosis of yourself. This is where it all begins. This is where the gospel begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is where it all begins. And I have to ask, is this your beginning? Is this your beginning? Do you understand that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you want to get saved, you want to be a Christian, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to have and manifest a beggarly spirit before God. Okay? But let's press on. Let's, let's ask another question. And, and here, here's the next one. This one is, what is promised to those who are poor in spirit? Okay? We've got to finish the verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit, just half the verse. What is promised to those who are poor in spirit? So look at verse 3 again. What does the second half say? For theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. And when you read for theirs, the Greek there has the sense of theirs and theirs alone. This is an exclusive bunch. They have exclusive rights on what's coming to them, these, those who are poor in spirit. And the question then comes, well, what is coming to them? Well, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, I, I don't want to spend a long time on this because I think it's fairly straightforward. When you read the kingdom of heaven, all that simply means is the rule of Christ, okay? You, you understand what that means, right? The rule of Christ. The rule of Christ now and the rule of Christ forever. So if you are in Christ, you now have the kingdom of heaven. You got that? It's an already not yet event. You now dwell in the spiritual heavenlies. You now have received all the spiritual blessings. Remember what Paul says? We move and walk as it were in the heavenlies. And, and, and the verb tense is now. We're, we're, in there, we're there now. We have the kingdom of blessings now. We have the grace of the kingdom now. We have the power of the kingdom now. We have the wisdom of the kingdom now. We have the sovereignty of the king over us now. We have the supply of the kingdom now. We have the riches of the kingdom now. We have the treasures of the kingdom now. It's ours. It's all ours now. We are the heirs of the kingdom. And as I said, it's ours and ours alone. And all that really means in a word is what? Salvation. You're saved. We get salvation. Isn't that good? We enter into the kingdom and receiving the kingdom, we received all the riches of what a king gives us. And it begins with salvation. Listen carefully. Salvation comes to people who are bankrupt in spirit, right? Salvation begins and comes to people who are bankrupt in spirit. And that's why Jesus begins here. This is why the first beatitude is you need to understand that you are a spiritual beggar. But let me hasten to add it. It doesn't just begin there. It continues, right? We said that last week. You begin poor in spirit, but you, you must be continuous in that activity of being poor in spirit. 
Once we come to Christ, we must maintain that same sense of spiritual bankruptcy that draws on the resources that God provides uh, in Christ. And we must never come to the place that we think that we have something to boast uh, in about ourselves. Individually or corporately, even as a church, we can easily drift from being poor in spirit. Um, you, some do, we all do, to one sense. And when we get to a point, we start boasting, right? Well, you know, look at us. We have two services on a Sunday, and we attend two services, and we only sing hymns, and, you know, we dress up for our Sunday best. And we, we just go right down the line, uh, just boasting and blowing our own trumpet of our own accomplishments and what we've done and what we don't do. I mean, it's very easy, right? It's very easy and quickly to go from being poor in spirit to being proud in spirit. That's why all the take heed, right? Be on guard verses. I mean, you go back to Galatians. Remember, this, this is at the heart of the, the letter of Galatians. They began well, right? They began in the spirit, but then they decided to be perfected in the what? Flesh. Paul says, who bewitched you? Who, who put a... Who put a um, a glaze over your eyes, as it were. I mean, you started off well. You started in the poor in spirit, but all of a sudden now you're proud in spirit. Right? What happened there? So being poor in spirit and staying poor in spirit, what do you get? You get Christ and His kingdom. And, and when you remind yourself of that every single day, that, that should keep you, what? Poor in spirit. You get Christ in His kingdom. We were driving on the way here. I hope I don't forget the line, but it was something like, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is mine. Something like that. And I thought, that, there it is. That's the summary of what a Christian is. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is all I have. And Jesus is all I need. But again, let's press on. Here's, a, here's another question, okay? Got a couple more questions to go. Um, perhaps we need to ask this one. How do we become poor in spirit? Right? How do we become poor in spirit? In other words, how do I learn self-denial in our lives? I mean, let's say, and I believe that, this, that if you are a true Christian, then there was a time in your life that you were poor in spirit. Right? You, you had to be. That, we've kind of argued that point. That's the fun, fundamental foundational characteristic of somebody that's a Christian. You begin at, a, at that point of being a spiritual beggar. But the, the question here then is how do we maintain that? How do we maintain that? Again, there was a time when we recognized we were bankrupt. There was a time when we saw that our, our, what our sin did before a holy God. Uh, and then, we, of course, were broken over that sin and we reached out like a beggar. But let's just say, well... Maybe you're not there anymore. You've drifted, right? That's Hebrews, right? You've drifted. And you become like the Galatians, and you become proud. And in that, I would guess that you're not happy anymore. Right? You're probably miserable, unhappy, and let's hope the Spirit of God is at work, and you want that happiness back. You want to know how to get back to that point of being poor in spirit or or maybe, let's just say, maybe you've never been poor in spirit. How, how do you get to that point where you become poor in spirit? Well, let me just suggest what's necessary for you to be poor in spirit, all right? Let's just give, me a, give you just a short little list of what's necessary to be self-denying or, or to be self-denial. Number one, here's, here's the first thing, and, and this is pretty straightforward. Look at God. You got that? Look at at God. To me, this is a sure remedy for self-evaluation. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah 6, he walks into the, into the temple because King Uzziah just died. King Uzziah, remember, wasn't a horrible king uh, and the, the Assyrians are knocking on the door and he had fortified the, the walls and the army, um, just kind of keeping the whole thing together because it was starting to crumble. But our king's dead. Isaiah kind of panics in a sense. He's, he's anxious. So what do you do? Well, let's take it to the Lord. So he goes to the temple thinking that he was just going to pray, but God pulls back the veil, as it were, and shows himself, right? And what was Isaiah's response? Woe is me, for I am done, for I have seen God. You know the Hebrew there of undone gives the picture that you and I are, are all sewn up together, 
And that when he saw God, all the seams started to come apart. We just started, I guess you could say melting, but all the, all the seams started coming apart. I'm a man of what? Unclean lips. And I live amongst the people of unclean lips. He saw who he really was in the holiness of God, in the face of God. So that's why I say the first step is look at God. Look at God. Remember 2 Corinthians 3.18? Paul says, as we gaze into a mirror, what's that mirror? The mirror is the word of God. As we gaze into that mirror and the glory of God is, is revealed to us from those pages, what? The spirit of God is transforming us, moving us from one level of glory to the next. To look at God. How, how do we look at God? No, I mean, we, we're not transported to heaven, going into his throne room, but we can see, see God on the pages of scripture. So read his word. Read his word. Reading His Word, you come face to face with Him. You come face to face with Christ, and that's how you are changed. That's how you mature, right? That's what the Spirit of God uses. He uses His Word. And I bet you the more you see God, the more you see Christ, and the more helpless you're going to see yourself. The only time we are proud, get this, the only time we are proud is the time we haven't been looking at God, because if you're not looking at God, who are you looking at? You're looking at yourself. Listen, if we look at other people, even looking at other people, we're going to be proud. Why? Because we're going to start comparing ourselves to them. I'm not as what? I'm not as bad as them. This is the world. This is how they operate, right? They, they boast in their self-righteousness because what's the standard? The standard is that guy. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm pretty good compared to that guy. And that guy comes, you know, He's over here saying, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. And that guy says, I'm not as bad as that. And so what's the standard? You know, the lowest scum of the earth, right? And the Bible says, no, 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 that's not the standard. God's the standard. You are to be what? Perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The standard's God. You don't look down, you look up. So look at God. Measure yourself against God. Measure yourself against Christ. And once you do that, then, then, then tell me where you see the boasting, okay? You, you tell me where you see the boasting, because I, I, I bet you when you start looking at God, it'll just shut your mouth. Secondly, not just look at God. If you want to experience poor in spirit, here's the second thought. Starve the flesh. Starve the flesh. You, you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is avoid those things that feed the flesh, Avoid the things that feed your pride. Avoid those things that feed your ego. That's what I mean by feeding the flesh, to starve it, starve it. And I'm not only talking about the, the obvious things that feed the flesh, you know, you know what you're watching on you know, TV or the movies, but, but even be careful who you listen to. Even preachers, be careful who you listen to. And, and, and even books you read, even Christian books that you read. A lot of them actually do feed the flesh, don't they? I mean, they, they tell you how, how great you are, how you can be fulfilled, how, how to crank up your self-esteem. You know, that doesn't do anybody any good. You know, I've looked long and hard to find a book that is on how to empty yourself, and I haven't found it. Or how to be a self-denying Christian. Very few of them out there. So starve the flesh. Thirdly, I would say, and again, this, is, this isn't rocket science, Pray. Pray. Look to God, starve the flesh, and pray. Why? Because if you're a spiritual beggar, a spiritual beggar does nothing but what? Ask. Beg. Remember the, remember the tax collector? Be merciful to me, the sinner. That's what he cried out. So look at God, look at Christ, starve the flesh, and pray. Ask God. Ask God to keep you poor in spirit. Ask God to keep you low. Ask Him uh, to keep you humble and dependent on Him. Okay? One final question. One final question. And I think this is even more practical. I think that was practical. But here, here, here's one final question I think is even more practical. And here it is. And how will you know if you are poor in spirit? How will you know if you are poor in spirit? I think this is a, a good question, right? If you understand what poor in spirit means, and why Jesus begins there, um, you know, how, how, to, how, how to get there. But how do you know if you've arrived? 
How do you and I know if we are truly poor in spirit? What's the test, if you will? How do I self-examine myself to see whether I'm poor in spirit or not? Well, again, let me just give you a short little list and some ways to make sure you know you are truly poor in spirit. All right? Here's number one. Just think about this. You will know you are poor in spirit, listen, when self will cease to be your major concern. You got that? When self will cease to be your major concern. David understood this. Psalm 131, verse 2. Listen, surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. What's he saying there? I, I, I've weaned myself. Self is less and less a concern. He says, weaned away from myself. That's what we need to do. We need to wean ourselves from ourselves. That's good. Like I said, self is not going to be a concern to you. How do you know if you're poor in spirit? Well, you're not going to be consumed with self. You're going to be completely cut off from self. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what it means is that you won't be concerned with how you look, how popular you are, how successful you are, how famous you are. You won't be concerned whether your needs are met, your wants are fulfilled, how people treat you. None of those will be a major concern. It's not an issue with you. Listen, the person who is poor in spirit is the person who is not preoccupied with self. You can't get any more clear. In fact, in fact, Jesus will camp on this in the next two Beatitudes. Why? Blessed are those who mourn and blessed are those who are what? Meek. How do you know if you're poor in spirit? Well, it'll show up because you're mourning over your sin and that you will have a meek and humble spirit about you. Secondly, again, we're looking at how we can know if we're truly poor in spirit. Here's another thought. You know you have true humility of spirit if you are lost in the wonder of Christ. If you are lost in the wonder of Christ. You're going to say, just show me the Lord and it is sufficient. Again, all I have is Christ. That's all I need. That's all you want. I mean, what did, what did sorry, Paul say? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That should be uh, the summary of our lives. That's a summary of someone who's poor in spirit. I just live for Christ. You know, I have a pastor friend in the Midwest, and when he took his um, charge there, he took the, the, the church, uh, the men there made a little plaque, and he put it there in the corner of his pulpit, and it was a verse that uh, it was John 12, 21. It was just the words, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. You go back and read the whole context, but there were men. And the disciples are at the door, kind of the bodyguards and the bouncers, Jesus inside. And they said, I think it was to Peter, in fact, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And they put it in the pulpit because um, that was their way of saying to the pastor, when you get behind the pulpit, that's all we want you to do. We want to see Jesus. That's good, isn't it? I mean, that's our attitude. That should be our attitude each and every Sunday. That when we come on Sunday, we should be asking the pastor, Hey, pastor, we want to see Jesus. Hey, preacher, we want to see Jesus. Because we want to remain poor in spirit. Listen, when your whole life is longing to see Jesus, to know Jesus, to be with Jesus, to live for Jesus, to love Jesus, I think that's a good way of saying that you're experiencing being poor in spirit. You'll be drawn away from yourself and, and you'll just find yourself lost in the wonder of Christ. So that's the second way of knowing. Here's the third way. You'll never complain about your situation. You will never complain about any situation. You, you say, why is that? Well, because a truly humble person knows they deserve what? Nothing. Right? 
Nothing. In fact, whatever you have, guess what? It's going to be a gift. Whatever you have is a gift. A gift of grace. Why? Because, again, you understand that before God you have nothing to offer and you deserve nothing. And so everything that's given to you is pure grace. And as a result, you never complain. You'll never complain about your situation or about anything. I mean, you, we all know what God thinks of grumblers and complainers, right? And listen, grumbling and complaining reveals not a poor spirit, but a what? Proud spirit. You think you're entitled to this, and you think you're entitled to that, and that's a raw deal, and that's a bad deal, and God thinks, you know, God should give me this and give me that. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Who do you think you are? You are a beggar. In, in fact, <laughs> realizing the, the, the depth of the hole you're in, the sweeter the grace of God, right? When you lack everything, let's say you lacked everything. Let's just say you lacked everything. And, got, you know, maybe some trial. Look at Job. God took everything, right? Except a, a grumbling wife. But, but let's give her a break. She lost everything too, Okay. Let's just say you, like Job, lost everything, then what? Then we just sing it? Blessed be the Lord? You, 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 you know, came with nothing and we go out with nothing. Anything that is given is by grace, and so we just bless the Lord. But you know, how, how, think about it. How good would it be if we didn't have anything? Because the more stuff we have, the more distractions we have, and the more complicated things are. And Actually, life would be good with just a few minimum things, wouldn't it? And actually, the minimum is just Christ and Christ alone. That's all we want. And I would bet you it's in that place you'll find true happiness. So my point here is that you can check your spiritual poverty by seeing if you're content. Let's just put it that way. See how content you are. You think you're content? Then that's a good sign that you're poor in spirit. I mean, Lamentations 3.39, I love this. It's one of my favorite texts. Just listen. Lamentations 3.39. Uh, Jeremiah there asks this, Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? That's stinging. What's he saying? You can't complain. Why? You're a sinner. You can't complain. You're, you, you are a sinner. So how do we know if we're poor in spirit? Well, uh, see how much or little you're complaining and grumbling. Number four, just keep moving on here. Number four, a truly spiritual poor person will see the excellencies of other people and the weaknesses of his own life. Got that? Let me say that again. A truly spiritual per poor person will see the excellencies of other people and the weaknesses of his own life. In other words, true humility is marked out by a sense of own, one's own weaknesses and eagerness to point out others' excellencies. The flip side of that is you're something special and everybody else is not, right? That's not poor in spirit. That's proud in spirit. And I tell you, if you get to a point where you can just boast of your weaknesses and boast of others' gifts, that's such an excellent characteristic. I love being around people like that. I love being around humble, meek people. You, 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 in fact, you look at most of my pastor friends, the ones that I gravitate to have that characteristic. I, I don't really gravitate to pastors who are full of themselves and always talking about you know, this and that and what they're doing. The poor in spirit sees no greatness in himself, but he is prone to see beauty and greatness in other people. In other words, it, it's the opposite of a critical mind. You know, that's why legalism and judgmentalism go hand in hand. I mean, if you find yourself often criticizing others, putting others down, pointing out their inadequacies, then can I just tell you right up front, you're not poor in spirit. You're not poor in spirit. And if that is a regular activity then you, dare I say, you might be pharisaical and legalistic. And I would watch out because God does what with the proud? He humbles them. 
and sometimes it hurts. Number five, two more, two more thoughts on this. Number five, a truly humble person will spend much time in prayer. We said that earlier, but this bears repeating because we're beggars again. That's what being poor in spirit is. You're a beggar. A beggar needs to spend a lot of time begging. And it's when you know you are a beggar that you have to go back to the what? Beginning process. One who is poor in spirit knocks frequently at heaven's gates and kneels before the throne of grace very, very often. So pray, pray. Do you find yourself praying? Are you dependent on God or are you just dependent on yourself? On your wit, your wisdom, your resources, your power. And again, that's proud in spirit. Poor in spirit says, I, I can't do it on my own. I can't do anything on my own. But I can do all things what? Through Christ who strengthens me. That, that's characteristic of someone who's poor in spirit. And one last one, number six. We'll wrap this up. Number six, someone who is poor in spirit will always have a praising heart. He or she will always have a praising heart, always praising God, always glorifying God. And you say, why is that? Because they're always what? Enjoying God. Isn't that why we're created? We're, we're created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So we're glorifying Him and we're enjoying Him. You know, you don't praise what you don't enjoy, right? Think about it. Um, I mean, in one sense, if you're always talking about yourself and you, you're always telling people what you're doing and where you're going and what you've accomplished, what you're really doing is, I love myself and I'm enjoying myself, right? But the poor in spirit person, remember the word is patakas. Patakas means a beggarly spirit. But the, the poor person, if you will, the patakas person, when filled are full of thanksgiving. Whatever they get from God, it's going to be a heart of gratitude. Songs of praise, songs of thanksgiving, just glorifying God and enjoying Him now and forever. So there, there you have There's a bit of a checklist to know if you are truly poor in spirit. Number one, Self will cease to be your major concern. Number two, you are lost in the wonder of Jesus Christ. Number three, you will never complain about your situation. Number four, you will see the excellencies of others and the weaknesses of yourself. Number five, you will spend much time in prayer. And then number six, you will have a thankful and praising heart. More could be said, but I think that's a, a fair evaluation, a good inventory to find out where your life is. And so... As we've said, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, is actually a self-examination. This is the character and conduct of a true Christian, someone who is born again. And so as you hear this, the question is, am I a Christian? Am I born again? Am I in the kingdom of God? It's not the perfection, but it is the what? The direction. Is this... This is what I want to be. I, I know I, I fail at so many points. I mean, you look at that list and you say, oh, I do complain. I'm not always lost in the wonder of Christ. And I probably do spend a, a, too much time criticizing others. But hearing that, am I quick to repent from it? Quick to realize, you know what? I, that's not being poor in spirit. I want to be poor in spirit. Well, may God help us to be and to act uh, what we are and what He's done in us through the Spirit of God. So, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first beatitude. Let's come back next week and we'll look at the next one. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for our time this morning. So much there to unpack. And, and it's truth that we love, even if it stings and hurts. Uh, when we're evaluating ourselves to the measure of yourself. And we do want you to be the standard. We want to be perfect as you are perfect. We want to be like Christ. We want to think like Christ and act like Christ and talk like Christ. So make us like Christ. Conform us to his image by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.